You are now listening to the Bayshore Community Church Podcast. Our mission is to connect to God, connect to people, and to serve the community. Thank you for joining us today and wherever you are listening. We hope that this message inspires you, encourages you, and transforms you. Our prayer is that this is just the beginning of a conversation between you and Jesus. Enjoy the message. Uh, we want to welcome our online audience. Let's give these guys a hand that are watching us right now. Thank you for watching us and uh, being with us. We are very important to us, and we're so glad that you're with us. And we got a lot of visitors here today, people visiting f- on the holidays. So happy Memorial Day weekend to everybody. And we're just so glad that you are here. Already had a service this morning at uh, Femic Island. Really wonderful service there. The Lord's moving at our Femic Island campus and uh, moving at this campus, Rehoboth campus. And we're just so glad that you're here at 1030. Thank you for coming and adjusting your schedules a little bit. We're, I'm so thankful for that. We are uh, in a series called Showdown in Egypt and we're talking basically about the life of Moses and how he confronted Pharaoh. It's a wonderful story in the book of Exodus, some great things that are in there. One of the things we see in uh, Moses' life, uh, you know, someone said that, you know, really you tell more about a person by what they do and what they say. When you look at Moses' life, there's a theme that is permanent, permanent, permanent in his life, and that is he constantly stood against injustice. Moses constantly stood against injustice. And when he saw injustice, when he saw someone that was being abused, someone that was being overpowered by a stronger person and exploited in some way, Moses consistently in his life stood up. And so one of the things, you can't look at Moses' life without recognizing that he had a passion to defend the weak, a passion to defend people that were being abused. Somewhat, I think the Webster's Dictionary says injustice is the absence of justice, a violation of what is considered right and just or of the rights of another and an unjust act. And so when you look at Moses' life, you see that he, whenever he saw injustice, whenever he saw unfairness, he stepped up and he responded to that. And I think one of the things we learned from Moses' life is that he was constantly on the lookout for people that needed defending. And we see in the book of Exodus, chapter one, verses 11 through 14, his very calling to go to Egypt is to liberate people that were being oppressed and controlled. And uh, there'll always be controlling people in the world. There'll always be controlling situations and controlling governments, controlling people that have a tendency to exploit the weak and the poor are always to be uh, confronted for that. Here's what it says in Exodus 1, 11 through 14. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor. And they built Pithom and Ramses, the store cities of Pharaoh. We're talking about the Jewish people being used to do that. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. Verse 11 says that they were forced labor. In other words, these uh, Jewish people weren't working for wages. They weren't working, you know, to, you know, have a better life. They were working for the benefit solely of the Pharaoh. And that's what exploitation is. When someone is used and they're uh, exploited for the benefit of another person. Uh, And we see this Pharaoh's using the Jewish people to build his store cities, to build his building projects. And so they're basically tools in his hands and he's working them ruthlessly. He's, He's not respecting them. And Moses, of course, is sent to stand up to that injustice, stand up that to, to that injustice. And the first two scenes we see in Moses' uh, life, his adult life, he's always confronting someone that's being abused. When you look at uh, Exodus 2, 11 through 14, uh, this is the story we've talked about a few times in this series. One day after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people, looking this way and that way and seeing no one. He killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. So when Moses saw the injustice, he responded to that. And you look at this first scene in Moses' life, one of the things that's obvious there is that he became aware of the injustice of his people being oppressed and seeing, seeing produces responsibility. 
When you're aware of something that's wrong, when you're aware of some injustice that's going on, when you come into the orbit of understanding that that's going on, there is a responsibility for all of us to respond to that injustice. One of the things you will see in Moses' life every time he sees injustice, he steps up to confront that injustice. The second scene in his life, Exodus chapter 2, verses 15 through 22, when he flees to Midian, he sees these poor little shepherd girls that uh, have come to water the flocks of their father, Ruel. And uh, he sees these shepherds come in and abuse them and take away their spot at the watering hole. And let me read it to you, Exodus 2, 15 through 22. When Pharaoh heard this, he tried to kill Moses, but Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian, where he sat down by the well. Now a priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came to draw water and fill, troughs, fill the troughs with water, their father's flock. Some shepherds came along and drove them away, but Moses got up came to their rescue and watered their flock. And the girls went home and Ruel said, now why have you come so early today? Now that means that this happened every day, repeatedly. This injustice happened time after time after time. They answered, an Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds. He even drew water for us and watered the flock. And he said, where is he? Ruel asked his daughters, why didn't you leave? Why'd you leave him, invite him to come and have something to eat? So when you look at Moses and he sees these poor little shepherd girls, they come and they're watering their father's flock and they get there early. But when these big, burly, uh, overpowering male shepherds show up, they come into the situation and they drive away the girls that have already been in line to get, the, get their flocks watered. And Moses sees that. Remember, seeing produces responsibility. He saw it. And he responded to that, and, he, and it says he got up. That's what the NIV says. But the ESV said he stood up. He stood up. How many know that we are called to stand up for things that are unjust? We're called to stand up for things that are not right. And the, the New Living Translation said Moses jumped up. He jumped up. When I was in high school, uh, I graduated from Seaford High School just after the earth's crust cooled a long, long time ago. <laughs> I was in study hall one day and uh, I got to study hall early and what I did at study hall is I uh, got to the back of the room and me and a couple other nerds, we played chess during uh, study hall. And so I'm in back there with the nerd section and we're playing chess and uh, I, have, I watched the door and there was this guy that came in, this little guy named Craig and I knew Craig, I went to church with him uh, when I was at the Methodist church when I was a kid and uh, he came in and he's carrying his books and as he's carrying his books, this big bully comes in behind him. And the bully grabs him by the shoulders, spins him around, and punches him in the face. His books go everywhere. And he grabs Craig, little Craig. Craig's not very big at all. He grabs Craig and throws him against the chalkboard. And he hits the chalkboard with his, the corner of his face and his eyes cut. And then the teacher walks in and this bully says to the teacher, Craig started this fight with me and I had to defend myself. And I'm sitting there and everybody's sitting there and Craig's face is bleeding. And I walked up to the desk of the teacher and I said, that's not what happened at all. What happened is Craig was walking in carrying his books and he was headed toward his desk and this big bully came behind him and spun him around and struck him and threw him against the chalkboard. And the teacher says, well, I'm going to send you and these two boys down to the principal's office to explain what happened. I wasn't planning on going to the principal's office, but I ended up <laughs> down there. And Mr. Johnson was the principal. He was a mean looking guy. And uh, we didn't want to mess with Mr. Johnson. And the bully spun his story and said, Craig started this fight. And, you know, I came in, he pushed me and all that. And all of it was fabricated. And I said to the principal, Mr. Johnson, that's not all, that's not at all what happened. I said, Craig walked in and he wasn't doing anything. He was headed toward his desk. He was headed toward the place where he was supposed to go. And this guy, unprovoked by Craig, attacked him. And Mr. Johnson said, you know what you're talking about, and expelled the bully. 
And I'll never forget that. And I looked at little Craig's face and his face was bleeding. And uh, Craig was a little guy. He wasn't very big. Uh, He was related. He was like a second cousin to me. And I'll never forget, you know, I felt so sorry for him because he was completely isolated by himself and nobody was standing up for him. And, you know, when I I think about that scene and I think about what happened is there was 30 people in that class sitting there watching that injustice and they didn't say a thing. You know, I think when we see injustice and we don't respond to that injustice, we are complicit with the exploiter that's doing that injustice. I think we become part of the problem when we don't step up and do something that we're supposed to do. And and so that's an important principle when you think about that. When you see some powerful person, some abusive person that's in a situation and they are abusing and exploiting somebody and you're aware of that and we're aware of that, we have a responsibility to speak up for that because Moses teaches us to see injustice is to be responsible to respond to that injustice. If you uh, have any Catholic background, uh, you may uh, remember a certain saint uh, that is in the past that uh, has an interesting story uh, and a wonderful, wonderful story from this guy, uh, St. Telemachus. Uh, St. Telemachus has, uh, his story is well known. Uh, he, he was a little monk that lived in Asia Minor. And Telemachus, you know, Asia Minor is currently Turkey. And all this little monk did was to tend his garden every day and to pray. He just tended his garden and he just prayed. And one day he's in his garden and he's praying and he's tending his garden and he hears the Lord speak to him. And the Lord says to him, I want you to go to the city of Rome. He wasn't sure if he was hearing the Lord. He kept kept hoeing his string beans and he's working on his garden and he kept hearing the voice of the Lord. I want you to go to Rome. I want you to go to the city of Rome. So this little monk, Telemachus, he packs all of his stuff in his little bag and he carries, uh, goes, carries that bag and he heads down the road and it takes him weeks and weeks and weeks to get to the city of Rome. And when he finally gets there, he, he's in the streets of Rome and the throngs of people are in the streets and they're headed toward the Colosseum and he gets himself caught up in that big throng of people headed toward the Colosseum and he ends up in the Colosseum and there's thousands and thousands of people there and he sees the two uh, gladiators stand before the emperor and the gladiators say to the emperor, we who are about to die salute you before we're going to die. And it was at that moment that little Telemachus realized that these two gladiators were going to fight to the death, shed their own blood for the entertainment of the crowd. And this little monk, horrified, horrified at the thought of that, started down the steps of the Colosseum toward the the floor of the Colosseum. And he was crying out all the way, in the name of Christ, stop, in the name of Christ, stop, in the name of Christ, stop. And he climbs over the wall and he's saying, in the name of Christ, stop. And there's people in the crowd think it's part of the show and they're laughing. They think it's so funny until they realize he's serious. And then they turn and they get angry that he's interrupting the fight. And they begin to boo and begin to yell. And he gets up to those two big gladiators and he says, in the name of Christ, stop. And one of the gladiators takes out his sword. And he plunges that sword into the heart of Telemachus. And lying on the dirt floor of the Colosseum, that little monk said, in the name of Christ, stop. It was 391 A.D., And there was a group of people in the corner of the Colosseum that headed toward the exit. Then there was another group over here that headed toward the exit. And group by group, section by section, people left the Colosseum. And it was the last time that gladiators fall in the Colosseum to their death. Because a little monk saw something unjust. 
He saw something out of line. He saw something unfair. And he had courage that was bigger than his body. And he spoke up and he said, in the name of Christ, stop. You know, part of our calling, when we think about what the church is called to do, what you're called to do, what I'm called to do, what our responsibility is, what we are called to do is the Bible says in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, 33, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you. Have you ever thought about what that really means? Seek ye first the kingdom, the rule of God and his righteousness, what is right And what that verse really means is that when we see injustice, to seek God's kingdom is to seek that justice occurs for people that are weak. That's an important part of what we're called to do. And you think of all the things that, uh, that you see that are unjust in the world. And when you, like Moses, you see an injustice, you see something where a powerful entity or a powerful person overpowers a weak person. We are called to step up and stand up and says when Moses saw those, those little shepherd girls being chased off by those bullies, Moses stood up and Moses did something. And that's what he teaches us. Numerous times in the Old Testament, we're called to defend the weak. Psalm 82.3, Psalm 82.3 says this, defend the weak. Defend the weak and the fatherless. Uphold the cause of the poor and the oppressed. Defend the weak and the fatherless. Uphold the cause of the poor and the oppressed. The word defend there in the Hebrew is shapat, and it means to judge or govern. Use legal means to protect the oppressed. Isaiah 117 says almost the same thing. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. And plead the case of the widow. People that are weak, people that are disenfranchised, stand up for those people. And then you have Proverbs 31, 8 through 9. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. For the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and needy. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. When I read that verse, I cannot help as an evangelical Christian, I cannot help but think about abortion in that situation. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Very complicated situation for some people. Obviously, we have people in our culture that have had, uh, you know, women that are in poverty, that men have fathered children and men abandon women. I believe that every man that fathers a child, he is absolutely financially responsible for the next 20 years of his life to take care of that child. And I'm grateful for people that we have uh, at our family college campus. We have a family that's adopted three or four children that were unwanted and brought them in. So that's that side of the equation. But here's how an evangelical Christian, if you wonder why people make an issue about that, Here's why they think about that. They think about it because there's an innocent child that's in a safe place that needs defending. The womb of a mother should be the safest place for a child in America. And when I think about that, I think about, you know, what happens to people and what they go through. I think about Mother Teresa, who in 1994 came to the uh, prayer breakfast in Washington, D.C. The, the politicians were there. The president was there. Uh, all the big wigs were there. Anybody that was anybody, the Senate was there. Congressmen were there. And this little old woman from Albania, she stands up in front of this uh, august all, uh, group of people, these educated, powerful people. And she's dressed in her little Indian garb with her white, with her blue stripes on it. And she says in her address, this little diminutive woman, she says, I feel that the greatest destroyer of peace today is abortion because it is a war against child, a child, the child, a direct killing of an innocent child. She said that. She was a Telemachus. She was someone that stood up and spoke up for those that have no voice. And so I think about that. I think about the importance of that and how important it is that there are people that have the courage to speak up and they're, they're bold and they are able to speak up with, with great grace and great strength. One of the things I think is important to understand about this whole principle of uh, how, we, how we deal with injustice is that we have to understand that there is a time, there's a time 
to be angry about things. Now, as a Christian, and uh, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you have trouble with your temper at all. I quit playing golf because of my anger. I think I had to give that game up. It wasn't working for me. How many know somebody that's got an anger problem? You don't need to point to them, you know, but... (laughs) So we're all trying to do better with our anger. Don't want to get mad at people. I saw, Karen and I were uh, down on Route 1 on Friday, and there was somebody driving in the bus lane. I guess they thought that was part of the deal. You could drive on the bus lane as long as you want to. And there was a man behind this car in his pickup truck that had the horn on incessantly, just telling, it was something had happened, and he was really, you know, letting that person know it. So there's anger that's personal that's a sin. But anger that is focused on injustice is not a sin. Here's what it says in the book of Ephesians, Ephesians 4.26. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. Well, that's a good translation, but here's a better translation. The English Standard Version says this, be angry and do not sin. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Be angry and do not sin. The word anger there, be angry, is in the imperative mood in the Greek. And what that means, it's a command. There are some things we need to be angry about. Some things we need to, to get worked up about. Some things we need to see that are unjust and we respond to that injustice. Jesus, when he was, uh, went and cleansed the temple, very controversial part of Jesus' life, In Matthew 21, he cleansed the temple. And when he cleansed the temple, uh, you know, if you look at the Gospels, if you read them, you pay attention to what's going on, he made a whip. And, you know, there's, I just read a Greek study on this is, you know, did he hit anybody with a whip? There's a big thing, but he made a whip and he came in and he wasn't sitting and tiptoe through the tulips. He came into that temple and Jesus was upset and he confronted an injustice. And what was the injustice? Well, the temple sold sheep and goats for sacrifice. And all these people from all over Israel came to Israel, came to Jerusalem for the the feasts that were offered there, the Passover feast, tabernacles, they had to offer a sacrifice. And these poor people that are under the oppressive Roman government, they're paying high taxes. They don't have two nickels to rub together. They save their money. They saved their money to have enough to buy a sheep to sacrifice at Passover. And they show up and they come into the temple. And the temple people that are selling the sheep have exploited the price. They've got the price real high because they got them there. They got to have a sheep. And these poor people pay extraordinary prices for a little sheep to sacrifice. They were gouging people in the temple when they needed a sheep to sacrifice at the offering. Another thing that happened is they, had to, they couldn't buy a sheep with a Roman coin. They couldn't take a Roman coin and buy a sheep because the Roman coin had the, had the picture of the emperor on it, and that was a graven image. So they had exchanged their money a Roman coin to uh, uh, an Israelite coin, and there was a high exchange rate to exchange the money. So Jesus turned over the money changers. He turned over the tables that were exploiting the, the high prices to exchange the money. He knocked over the cages because it was unjust. And Jesus, Jesus was not mild and meek in that scenario Jesus came in and he was filled with 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 indignation toward the injustice so Ephesians says be angry and sin not so there's a time to get angry now somebody cuts you off in traffic that's not occasion to be angry you do get angry obviously and uh but Anger is when you see a person that's oppressed, you see a person that's being exploited, when you see somebody that's being taken advantage of, and you respond to that situation and you do something about it. So exploitation and dealing with anger is that whole idea that when you see a weak person being exploited by a strong person, you respond to that injustice by doing something. 
The book of James, everybody loves the book of James. You know, we love to study the book of James. The book of James is a lot about injustice. You know, we read the book of James and uh, you have a Bible study in the book of James. Everybody's there. Everybody loves the book of James. I love the book of James too. I think it's great. I don't know, but it's really a popular book. I think it's because it's a little bit about, you know, works and you need to have, you know, faith, uh, you know, faith needs to be backed up with works and all that. So we have to contextualize it properly. But a lot of what the book of James is about is about injustice. And it says this in James chapter five five verses one through six now listen you rich people weep and wail because of the misery that's coming on you your wealth has rotted and malls have eaten your clothes your gold and silver are corroded their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire you have hoarded wealth in the last days look the wages of those who failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you so James says listen if you are if you have wealth and you have power and you have business and you're making lots of money and you got people working for you, that you're paying them a, a wage that's not fair, that it says that the Lord of the harvest will judge people that exploit people and just use people. So that's a part of what the, the book of James is about. So here's what we see in the story of Moses. We have compassion toward people that have been exploited, that are being exploited. Why do we do that? We do that because God has compassion on them. Exodus 3 verse 2 says, the Lord said, I have indeed seen, I've seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. Therefore, Moses, I'm sending you. Why should we be concerned about people that are oppressed? Why should we be concerned about that? We should be concerned about it because God is concerned about people that are oppressed. God is concerned about people that are being exploited. And the other thing is, is that uh, we should be concerned about people that are oppressed and being exploited because we need to think this way. Anybody that's being exploited, anybody that's being mistreated, that could be me. That could be me. When I uh, visit my dad, my dad has dementia um, and my dad, uh, he tells some of the same stories all the time and I enjoy, I go, go talk to him and uh, Karen and I clean his house and I take him out to dinner some. And so when I go visit my dad, he always tells me the same stories over, over and over again. Almost know what stories are going to come in what sequence. And I, I think to myself, one day I'll miss these stories. And I, I'm, I'm listen to him and I, I listen to it like I've never heard these stories before. But one story he tells all the time is about when he went to Haiti he went to Haiti, and uh, he was a minister, and he went with some other church, and he went to Haiti. First time my dad was ever out of the USA. And when he got to Haiti, of course, Haiti, I think at that time, and probably still is, is the second poorest nation in this hemisphere. Uh, I don't know if it's as poor as India, but it's a poor, poor place. And my dad saw poverty like he's never seen poverty before he tells me the story of the little children on the garbage dump looking for food the people behind the motel digging in the trash bins to try to find food he tells me the story all the time i can ask a question and i can provoke that story i can bring up that story like a jukebox i can say something about it he'll he'll tell me that story but he always tells the story this way he says he says, why were they born there? And why was I born here? That's how he ends the story. Why were they born there? And why was I born here? And that's a good question. Why am I born here? Why do I have a two cars and two garages and why do I have everything I have and I shouldn't feel guilty about it you shouldn't feel guilty about it we're blessed how many know that you are blessed to have what you have over you just raise your hand and say thank you Lord for all the stuff I have I just got a new grill I'm telling you I got a new grill I'm loving my grill I don't know how to use it but I'm cooking stuff on there burning stuff you know 
I, I clean, I, it's like one of these Blackstone grills. It's not a Blackstone, but something like that. And so the first time I cooked on it, I said, uh, I didn't know how to clean it. So I called my friend, Tom Taylor, I said, how do you clean this thing? He said, did you cure it? I said, did you cure it? Did you cure it? You mean these things have to be cured? I mean, we went this big conversation about curing the grill. And I, I, you got to cure a grill if you get it. So I know how to do that. Now watch 150 videos on YouTube about how to do that. <laughs> We got a lot of stuff, and that's good. That's good. Never forget, never forget how privileged you and I are. We are privileged. My dad says, why were they born there and I born here? Why do I have two cars and only 8% of people in the world have a car? And I have two of them. So... Part of what we see in the story of Moses is when he sees poverty, he sees injustice, he sees people suffering, he does something about it and he gets between the oppressed, he gets between the person that's being beat down, the poor slave that doesn't have any money, the poor slave that's completely uh, under the power of the Pharaoh, and he defends the injustice and he stands up against that. There's people that you and I know that have done that. Martin Luther King Jr., I have a dream. I have a dream of a world where people love each other. And Martin Luther King, I loved how he f f guided his movement. He said, if you use violence, you're not of us. We don't do crazy, violent things, but we stand up. We do what needs to be done to protect those that have been exploited. To see exploitation is to be responsible to do something about that exploitation. I have a friend, some of you have heard me tell the story, a friend from Texas, uh, he's from St. Marcus, Texas. He was one of the teachers at the Bible college where I went to, uh, and he, uh, he loves to fish, and back in the 80s, he was uh, fishing down in Pensacola, Scamba County Bay there, and he's out there in his boat, and he's, he's fishing. He's getting ready to speak at a singles conference that night, and he's just kind of relaxing, thinking about his message, and he's out there in the bay just by himself fishing. And he hears, a, he hears, a, a, hears these dogs in the woods around a Scamba County Bay. He hears these dogs that are barking and chasing something. He thought there must be a deer. They must be chasing a deer. And he kept looking, and sure enough, it wasn't long before a deer came out into the bay, and there's these, these wild dogs, their heads bobbing, chasing that deer in the bay, and they're going after the deer. And, and uh, Jim said as they got closer and closer, uh, they would put their paws on the back hinds of that deer and the, the back would go down and that deer is trying to get away from those wild dogs. And so Jim reeled in his rod, his fishing line, and he fired up his boat and he took that boat out in the bay where those dogs were and he got, got his boat between the wild dogs and the little deer swimming for her life and the dogs would try to swim around the boat and he would bump into the dogs and the dogs finally got discouraged and the dogs swam off to shore and Jim stayed with that with that little deer and he's saying to that little deer come on you can make it it's a little doe and it's swimming and it's just uh, just just barely has enough energy and he's coaching that deer and Jim said I felt like such an idiot talking to that little deer but said you can make it you can make it and that little deer got to the got to the shore and he's the little doe stood up on the shore and he said that deer was completely drained of fear of man. And that deer just stood there by Jim's boat. He even took his lure and threw it up against the feet of the deer and the deer just completely calm. And finally the deer turned around and went into the woods. What we do when we encounter injustice in this world is we come between the oppressor. We come between the one that's in power that wants to do harm to the weak and we defend the weak. We defend the weak.
One of the ways that we want to do that today, we want to do something practical today to, to deal with this. We want to uh, give 15% of our offering today on all of our campuses to uh, stop human trafficking. How many have ever heard about human trafficking in the news? Have you watched human trafficking? Anything about that? There's a great organization called A21 by uh, Christine Kane. Some of you have heard. How many have ever heard Christine Kane speak at a uh, conference? She's amazing. She's from Australia. Christine Kane in 2007 was walking through the airport of Thessalonica, and she saw all these pictures of these girls on the wall of the airport. And what she realized after she did some investigation is all those girls, those pictures of those young girls, were girls that were missing that had been captured by human traffickers for the sex trade. And Christine Kane did research. She found some horrible things or some things I wouldn't even tell you in this sermon. It's so uh, un, un, just awful. But there's two types of human trafficking. There's a labor Trafficking, human trafficking, where people are captured and um, manipulated, promised a job on the internet, promised a job on Facebook, and they show up to some place and all of a sudden they're taken captive and they end up working in some controlled environment under the power of a strong person. Or a young girl that is told about, you know, some guy on the internet that shows interest in her and, and uh, she's hungry or for romance and, and she gets lured into the situation. It's, it's a controlling uh, person that sells her into the sex trade. You say, is that a real problem? Is that a real problem? 40.3 million. 40.3 million people are in uh, human trafficking control now. 40.3 million people, many more people in slavery today that were in slavery before the Civil War. Many, many more people. This, the human trafficking uh, industry, if we can call it that, makes $150 billion per year. $150 billion a year. Happens in every country, happens in every state, happens in this state, happens in Maryland. It's under the radar, but there's people that are being exploited. Here's an interesting stat, 71%, 71% of the people that are in human trafficking under the control of exploited people in human trafficking, 71% are women. 71%, 29% are men, and then some children. 5.4 out of every 1,000 people are enslaved. So we said, what can we do? I, when I studied this thing on, on Moses and his life, and I saw him stand up for injustice, the Holy Spirit just really spoke to me. I want you to do something. I want your church, I want Bayshore to do something. And so today when we give... Uh, Right off the top, more than a tie that's going right to help Christine Kane's organization, A21. And A21 is called A21 in order, uh, the vision is, is to end human trafficking in the 21st century. So when I think about, I think about Moses, I think about, think about Jesus going to the temple. I think about when I see this, when I see things, I think the Lord is uh, saying to all of us, to see injustice is to be responsible for that injustice. And when we go back to our, our neighborhoods, our schools, we go back to our world, may the Lord give us eyes to see injustice. When you see a Craig being thrown up against the wall, when you see someone that is being expo exploited by a uh, more powerful person that the Holy Spirit used you. When Jesus stepped into that temple and he saw those poor, ragged people that had come to that temple to worship Jehovah, to worship Yahweh, and they took all of their money, everything they had, they took every penny they had, their savings, to buy a lamb. When Jesus saw those fat cats in the temple leadership, and that was exploiting that, he became mad. 
You know what MAD stands for? MAD stands for making a difference. Everybody say it with me. MAD stands for making a difference. Would you lift your hands right now? Let's let the Holy Spirit minister to us. Father God, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your power. We thank you for your glory. We thank you that you're making Bay Shore a church with, with muscles. You've given us muscles, Lord, to stand up. You've given us resources. There's people that are in this service right now and people watching online that are in strategic places in our community. They're in their teachers. They're in the schools. They're in the hospitals. They're in law enforcement. Lord, may they be empowered to be your agents of justice. That we will seek your kingdom and we want righteousness, that which is right and that which is just to be done. So we ask your blessing on us today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you so much for joining us on the Bayshore Podcast. I want to encourage you to take this message you just received and allow it to go deep into your soul and let Jesus do the deep work that only he can do. A special thanks to everyone that gives generously to Bayshore. It's because of you that this ministry is possible, creating life change all over the world. You can be a part of spreading the message around the world by going to bayshore.online and clicking give. For all things Bayshore, visit bayshore.online to find out what your next step may be. You can subscribe right here and share this podcast with your friends and family. Thank you again for listening. God bless you.